is one of the best things we can do in our day, in our life. It's to exalt God, it's to lift him up. To put him above everything, to put him before everything. Because things are gonna try to come between us and God. But our goal is to keep our eyes on him. Our goal is to lift him up, to keep him where we can see him. To lift him up, to exalt him above all else in our lives. Because, again, distractions are coming. Other things are coming. But we do ourselves the best service when we lift up the name of the Lord when we lift him up above all else. And today being the fourth the third of July. What is today? The fourth, the fourth of July. <laughs> which will be recognized on tomorrow, which is what was throwing me off. But today is we, we, we celebrate independence. We celebrate freedom. We celebrate the, the liberation from the tyranny of another government, from an oppressive government, <laughs> other countries have their Independence Day that they celebrate, and we as believers, even on today, just like pretty much with every other major holiday. We can celebrate Independence Day every day because of what Jesus did for us. But our scripture this morning, we're going to come from Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. These may be familiar verses to you in the fact that we've heard them, read them numerous occasions. Galatians 5 and 1. Galatians 5 and 1. And it reads just simply, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. It's a simple verse. And it's an encouragement. It's a command. It's an order to stand. It's an order to, to stand fast, to hold on to your ground, to hold on to your position, to remain where you are. Stand fast in the liberty in the liberty, in the freedom that Christ has made us free. In this, in this verse, he's answering the argument that has been brought before him by fellow believers that we're taking the freedom that Christ brought to us this, in the salvation and they were bringing it back under subjection of the law. And Christ in his coming did not come to abolish the law but to fulfill the law. But the law in and of itself, the way it was taught, the way it was practiced, was a was a yoke, was a was a burden. Because it couldn't save, but it could only condemn. It could only convict. It could not save. It could not redeem. It could only point out our sin. 
But once Christ came and fulfilled the law and wiped away sin with his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, wiped away the effect of sin on our lives once we receive him, now we've been set free. Set free from condemnation. Set free from the influence of sin in our lives. Set free from the burden to sin. Set free from the obligation we have to our flesh to fulfill and satisfy it in whatever way our flesh decides and determines. So we are set free from the law. We're set free from the bondage, the yoke of bondage. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty. Stand fast. Stand fast is to remain planted, to stay seated, to, to, to remain where you are in the face of adversity, in the face of opposition, in the face of resistance, to your stand, to your position. Because we're going to come against, we have an enemy. <laughs> we have an enemy that, 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 that wants us not to progress, not to proceed, not to prevail, not to succeed in our walk with God, not to experience victory, not to experience the satisfaction, not to, not to walk in and enjoy the freedom and liberty that Christ has given us. So as we read this again, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. He's saying, don't take this freedom that I've given you in, in, and now having gone from condemnation to, to, to restoration and having gone from condemnation to salvation and, and having gone from separation to relationship with God now into intimate relationship with God now, a fragmented, broken relationship to an intimate sonship with God now. Don't take that and go back to what you are familiar with. Don't take that and go back to, but move forward, stand fast in the newness of this relationship that we have now and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Don't go back to the old. Don't go back from whence you came. Think about what he's saying. Listen to the, the, the mindset and the principle of what, what they're trying to do. They're trying to take this freedom now that's been given, that's been bestowed upon them, and they're trying to take it and go back to the place where once they were in bondage, where once they were held captive, what does that sound like? That sounds like the children of Israel having been freed from bondage and at the first sign of resistance, at the first sign of trouble, at the first sign of tribulation, at the first, at the first obstacle, their desire is to run back to the place where they were held captive. Their desire was to run back to the place. Were there not enough graves in Egypt that you brought us out here to die? Instead of standing fast in their liberty, instead of saying, oh God, you who set us free from, from captivity from captivity and bondage, you who set us free, get us through this obstacle now. It's, oh, let me go back to the place of familiarity where I did not, where I was in bondage, where I was oppressed, where I was not happy, but it's familiar. So in this new freedom where I'm experiencing new things, where I'm walking in unfamiliar now, as soon as I come up against an obstacle, as soon as I come up against resistance, my, my fight or flight is to fly back to bondage, oppression, unhappiness. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So don't take this new freedom that Christ has given us and try to put it back under the law. Don't take this new freedom that God has, that, that, that God has given us and, 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 and run back to the old place. The two don't mix. Only in Christ where he fulfilled the law. 
He did not abolish the law. He didn't get rid of it. He didn't supersede it. He fulfilled it. He didn't make it useless. He didn't make it obsolete. He fulfilled it. He added walls to the framework. The, the law was only intended to point us to Christ. The law was our schoolmaster. The law was what escorted us to Christ. And Christ came and he fulfilled what the law could not do. But when we talk about Christ setting us free, when we talk about be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage, yes, the law was a yoke of bondage that we were under. But in our life, in our walk, as we go through our days, in our experiences with people, with, with situations, with circumstances. There are other yokes of bondage that we can pick up and put on. You see, in that when Christ set us free, I'm gonna put a pin there. I'm gonna put a pin there just for a second. And go back to Psalm 34. Go to Psalm 34. And I had it marked in 34. Verses 3 and 4. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. Quickly, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Magnify means to look at more closely, to examine, to, to break down the details of. Let us look at God intently. Let us press into God. Let us get closer to God so that we see him in greater detail. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Don't, come on, brethren. Come on, other people. Let's do this together. Let's do this. He doesn't say, I'm going to and I'll come back and tell you what I find. No, let's do this together so that we can see. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I exalt thee, O Lord. Two songs today. I exalt thee, O Lord. The wonders of your love, the beauty of your peace, the splendor of your joy lives in me. So because of that, I exalt you. Because of that, I lift you up. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let me look closer. Let me look at you in greater detail. Let me examine you. So that I can lift your name because when I look at you in greater detail, when I learn more about you, when I examine you, the more I learn about you, the more natural it is. Not easy, the more natural it is for me to exalt you. When a problem comes, when a situation comes, when, when, I've, been, when I've been newly freed out of bondage and I'm walking out with the, the riches of the people because they couldn't wait for me to get out of there because of what you have done for me. When I come across that first Obstacle. When I come across that first bit of resistance, my inclination isn't to go back to the bondage place of bondage because it's familiar. My inclination, what is more natural to me now, because I have examined you, because I have magnified you, is to lift you up, is to exalt you, lift you up above prominence, to lift you up above influence, to lift you up in importance, to lift you up in prominence above the situation, above the problem, above the resistance, above the issues. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. I sought the Lord and he heard me. I cried out and he heard me. And when he heard me, he delivered me from all my fears. 
He didn't take away all the things that I need to be fearful of. He took away, he, 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 excuse me, delivered me from my fears. He delivered me from the need to be afraid of any of those things. He didn't take all those things away that I might be fearful of. He didn't do that. He delivered me from my fears. Because how? Why? Because I magnified him. Because I magnified him. Because I examined him. Because I got so close to him that I could see him in greater detail. Not so that, not, not that I know everything about God, but I know everything I need to know about God. I don't know there's so much about God that I can't learn anymore because he is infinite. Because he's too big for me to know everything about him. And that doesn't deter me. That doesn't hinder me. Because it's what I do know about him that makes me want to exalt him. And when I exalt him, when I lift him up above everything else, guess what? He's delivering me from my fears because I know so much about him because what I do know about him makes me not have to fear anything that's coming, that's coming up in opposition, that's coming up in resistance, that's coming up as an obstacle. Why? Because I have magnified him. I have examined him so I can, so I can exalt him above, so that I can lift him up above all of those things. All of those situations. David said, I oh magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from my fears. So what does that have to do with Christ setting us free? Same principle. Same principle when we think about everything that Christ did for us. When we think about the fact that the same God whom we magnified, <laughs> whom we exalt, who, who's delivering us from our fears because we know him. And if we know him, we don't need to fear anything that is below him, beneath him, less than, not nearly as great as he in our lives, then we need not fear that we need not, that our fight or flight becomes fight with God on our side. Why? Because he's already won. Christ even told us, because I have overcome this world. I've overcome this world. So nothing this world can throw at us. Christ hasn't already overcome. Christ, disease, Christ already overcame it. Poverty, Christ already overcame it. Anything that the world wants to throw at us, discomfort, discontent, Christ already overcame it. So because of who Christ is, because of our position as sons of God, because of our position as co-heirs with Christ, because of our position of having come from condemnation into salvation, from condemnation into restoration, from condemnation into redemption, from separation to, to adoption. We need not fear because we've gone from there, away from God, to in relationship with him. There's the freedom. We need not fear. He also tells us, don't worry. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. If we can bring anything and everything before the Lord, before the God whom we have examined, before the God whom we have looked to, looked at in great detail, before the God that we have lifted up, and because we have lifted him up because of who he is, and he's taken away all our fears, if we, if he's taken away all our fears, and then we, then he tells us to trust in him, and he tells us to bring every situation before him so that we need not worry We don't have to fear. We don't have to worry. These are, these are two 
huge yokes that we pick up and put on unnecessarily. The yoke is going to try to come upon us. It, it's going it's to work its way there. Fear, fear is the emotion. Fear is the thing God gave us. We're going to experience fear. But when, when we lift God up, amazingly, when we lift God up, that yoke of fear comes off. He delivered me from all my fears. Why? Because I've examined him. Because I've looked close and looked at him in great detail. Because I've gotten so close to him that I can see him now in greater detail than I could when I was further back away from him. But when I when I lifted up God, that yoke couldn't stay on my shoulders. Because my hands are lifted up because I'm exalting God in that yoke. There's no room for a yoke on my shoulders. We can pick up a yoke of worry. But when we magnify the Lord, when we exalt him, again, that's a, there's a yoke. It's a yoke that cannot stay. It's a yoke that cannot stay. Another yoke that we pick up is the yoke of offense. That's a big one. It's a popular one. <laughs> but there's a reason if you notice with the state condition of offense, you have to declare I'm offended. You have to declare I find that offensive. You have to declare I take offense with that. But, but, <laughs> if you choose to examine God instead of examining what was said or done, if you choose to examine God, don't examine the situation that was offensive. Don't examine the person who brought about the offense. Don't examine the words that came forward from the mouth of that person that offended you. Don't examine those things. Examine God. Examine God. Magnify God. Get closer to God. Get closer to God and lift him up and watch that yoke of offense fall off. Watch that yoke of offense fall off. The second greatest commandment, Jesus says, love thy neighbor as thyself. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Don't love just yourself. Don't love your neighbor without loving yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Treat your neighbor the way you would treat yourself in any given situation. So in, an, in, in, in a situation where your neighbor has brought offense, treat your neighbor the way you would treat yourself. Treat your neighbor the way you would want your neighbor to treat you. That's God's rule as well. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's all in God. <laughs> so if we examine him, we, we will know these things about him. That he wants us to live a certain way. That he wants us to live without fear. That he wants us to live without worry. That he wants us to live without offense because these are the big three that take us out. These are the big three that distract us. These are the big three that anchor us down. These are the big three that weigh us down from moving forward in God in glorious fashion. They're not the only ones. But these are, these are three big ones. I, I, I don't have time to address <laughs> a, a whole bunch of them. But these are, the big, these are the big three that God has laid on my heart today. Offense, offense, offense. Worry, fear, and offense. These are the three that can lay us out, take us out, distract us, get us that one degree off to where we're no longer aiming at God. But when we examine God, when we look at When we put God in that place, then we're less likely, less likely to be offended when we're walking in love. 
Love is patient and is kind. <laughs> love is long-suffering. Love does not exalt itself. Love does not is not puffed up. Love is all read, read through 1 Corinthians chapter 13 to see what love is. And if you're walking in love, yielded and submitted to the Holy Spirit, offense is a burden that slips off your shoulders. Walking in love like that, I, I think of it as like putting butter or some slippery substance on my shoulders. So that when a fence tries to come in and sit on there, it slips right off. It slips right off. And it and it and it 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 it, 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 it slides off much more easily when I when I raise up my hands. When I exalt God, when I lift up God over over that offense, over that situation, over that person, over that, over that fear, over that worry, it just slides off that much easier. And you 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 know what adds? to the slickness of your shoulders. The fruit of the Spirit, walking in the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, mercy, self-control. All of these things, all of these things, again, make it easier for that burden of offense to slide off your shoulders because it can get heavy. And it doesn't just sit there the longer we leave it. It grows. It grows. Why? Because we feed it. We feed it. Our eyes are not on God anymore. We're no longer examining God. We're examining the person. We're examining what they did. We're examining what they said. We're examining ourselves. How much we hurt because of what they did. How much, how badly it hurt. Because our eyes are now inward. The word offense, you spell it O-F-F-E-N-S-E. -F -E. But in the literal sense, it starts with the letter I. I'm offended. I take offense to that. I find that offensive. It starts, it starts with the letter I. But if we take that letter I, bring it before the Lord. Examine God. Examine God. Press in to him so that we're seeing him in greater detail that will cause us to lift him up. It will cause us. It, it, the beauty of it is, 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 is David, he just, when he's, as he's doing it, he says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. He's, he's experienced and tasted how good God is, and he doesn't just want it for himself. He's wanting to bring others with him. He's saying, oh, let's magnify the Lord. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name. Let us lift him up together. Why? Because, it's because we're, it's, it's, we're stronger when we're lifting up God. We're more unified when we're lifting up God. We are on one accord when we're lifting up God. We don't have to agree, agree about every little single thing under the sun. You can like Adidas. I can like Nike. You can like Chevy. I can like Ford. You can like Chitlins and I can like pizza. But we're on one accord when we lift up the Lord. Doesn't matter if you're Chevy or Ford. You're on one accord when you lift up the Lord. Yeah, I like that. But anyway. Going back to Paul's exhortation in Galatians 5 and 1. Stand fast in the liberty. Stand fast in the liberty. Wherewith Christ has made us free and be not entangled again with the yokes of bondage. Stand fast in what Christ did for us. Look to the cross. Look to that empty, now empty cross and everything that Christ went through before he got there on his way to the cross. Look at what he went through as he was on the cross and look what he did for us when he came down off of that cross. And he did not come down off of that cross breathing. He was lowered. His body was lowered off of that cross. And he 
conquered death. It was in his yielding, giving up the ghost. resurrected and ascending into heaven that he overcame the world. And if Christ who is co-heir our co-heir whom with, with whom we are co-heir because he was the heir already and in his death, burial, resurrection and ascension and us receiving him as Lord and Savior he lifted us up into that place of co-heirship with him We are free from the bonds of sin. We are free from condemnation. We are free from all of that. And in addition to all of that, we are free from having to fear situations, circumstances, conditions that do not have our best interest at heart. We don't have to fear those things. We don't have to worry about those things. When offenses come and offenses are going to come, we examine God. We look at him in the great detail. As believers on this side of the cross, we examine God and we look at him in greater detail and we are reminded that he sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. To release us from the condemnation, from the potential of spending eternity separated from a loving God who would be our Heavenly Father. When we examine God, when we look at God and remember who He is and what He did for us, remember that Christ paid the price for us. To be that bridge between us across the gap of sin that was created when Adam disobeyed, when Adam sinned, when Adam fell in the garden. Christ gave himself so that he could be that bridge. To cover the gap that sin created, that sin is between man and God. Let's go to John chapter 8 for just a second. John chapter 8. And it's verses 31 through 36. I'm going to read those aloud. Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples, then are you my followers. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. <laughs> they answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall ye shall be free indeed. Whom the son sets free is free indeed. Whom the son, if the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Deed. And this is what Paul is trying to tell us. Stand fast in the liberty because we are made free in Christ. Stay free. Stay free. Don't run back and pick up old yokes. Don't run back to Egypt because there's a because 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 there's a sea in front of us and Pharaoh's chariots are bearing down on us. Don't long for Egypt in that situation. Stay Stay free, stand fast in the liberty which has been bestowed upon you, which has been gifted unto you. The children of Israel were carrying, had in their possession 
the riches of the people of Egypt, not the king. They didn't get anything of the king's riches, but they got of the riches. They got of the, 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 the plenty, the, the, the bounty that they were carrying was uh, from the people because they, God told them to go ask your neighbor for stuff. And the neighbors were more than, their, their neighbors, their Egyptian neighbors were more than happy to give them stuff, to get them out of here. Because they had endured 10 plagues. Your God ain't cool with us. Your God does bad things to us. Y'all gotta go. Yet holding those riches, yet in possession of those riches that they have because of everything that God did on their behalf to give them, to liberate them out of bondage, yet the first, the first obstacle that they came to had them uh, had their eyes on going back to Jesus. Even in the time when Moses was on Mount Sinai receiving, receiving the Ten Commandments, their hearts turned. Their hearts turned, and their plan was to go back to Egypt. That's why they made the golden calf. Let's go back to Egypt. Let's go back to bondage. Let's go back to where we were not happy. Let's, let, let's go back to where for 400 years our ancestors cried out for this very freedom that we are walking in, that we are enjoying. But because we're in an uncertain situation and time right now, we're not holding on to. But Paula is telling us in Galatians in repetition God confirming by the power of the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul what Jesus was conveying to the Jews whom the Son sets free is free indeed no one no one can come and put us in bondage but we can walk back into it. We can let it go. We can relinquish it. This freedom Christ has given us. God took care of Pharaoh's armies in the Red Sea. God took care of Pharaoh's armies before the Red Sea was opened because a wall of fire kept them kept his armies from God's people. Same God. Same God is able to keep us. The same God is keeping us through, through our trials, through our temptations, through our tribulations, through our situations, through our circumstances, through whatever condition we may come across. God is keeping us through all of those things. All of those things are temporary, but our freedom God has given us is eternal. We, we can relinquish our freedom by carrying unnecessary burdens don't carry fear. Don't carry worry. Don't carry offense. Walk in love. Be yielded and submitted to the Holy Spirit. Do these things. Jesus said, if ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples. Continue in the word. We have to read the word. We have to study the word. David said in Psalm 119, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Look at, look at the flow of the word from David to Jesus. <laughs> David to Jesus, the one who God said, David, there will always be someone on your throne. Jesus, the manifestation of that. 
Things that I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Jesus continuing that very thought saying, if ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. David was known as a man after God's own heart. God spoke that himself. You are a man after my own heart. You are a man in pursuit of my heart. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. You shall know the truth. You have to know the truth in order for the truth to make you free. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's the Jesus that you know that will make you free. It's the Jesus that you know that will make you free. He's made us free. We as the believers, we as his children, we as co-heirs, have been made free. Stand fast in that freedom. We've been given the liberty. Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. That's not the way God intended us to live. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. Acknowledge the Lord in all your ways and he will make your path straight. He'll make our path straight. He will show us. Another version says, and he shall direct your path. He shall direct your path. He shall show you where to go. He shall show you. He shall lead you and guide you. Psalm 23, he will lead us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Lead, he will lead us. He's, he's, he's. <clears throat> the word lead, the word lead implies a submission, a submitted followership. You have to submit to the leader. The leader's not going to put you in bondage and drag you along. The leader's going to say, this is the way to go. Let's go. It's up to us to follow. Jesus said, as ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples, my followers. My followers, not my captives, but you are my followers. We have to choose to follow. We have to yield, submit to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is going to lead us and guide us. But we have to be submitted. We have to be yielded. And when we are yielded, when we give over responsibility for trying to find our own path, for trying to make our own path, then guess what? <laughs> the yoke is lifted. The yoke and the burden of having to do that is, is, is lifted. And once again, we are what? We are made free. We are made free. I'm going to read through Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. One more time, and we're going to close with the word of prayer. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Let us pray. Lord God, our hallowed heavenly Father, you whose name means so much to us, we can call you by so many different names and each one is true we will call upon your name oh God for you are worthy to be praised and you will show up in our situation in the manner that you know is going to best benefit us we might believe we need you to show up in one capacity but you can show up in an entirely different capacity but the important thing is that you show up you are there, your word says, you will never leave us nor forsake us. And that promise remains as yet, even up to this very breath, unbroken. So, Father, we thank you, O oh Lord, 
for all that you are to us, all that you are for us, all that you are in us, and all that you are through us, Almighty God. Thank you for being Abba Father. Thank you for being Daddy God. Thank you for your word, the inerrancy of your word, the life giving power of your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, Father God, who takes that word and caters it to our life. Hides it within our hearts, Lord, as we receive it. Thank you, Father, for a leading, for a guiding, for an unctioning that lets us know this is the way. Oh God, that it is your desire for us to magnify you, to examine you in greater detail, to lift you up. Thank you, Father, that we can seek you. You can deliver us from all our fears. Thank you, Father. you never more than a prayer away, a bended knee, an uplifted hand. Thank you, Lord. God, receive our praise today. Thank you for sitting enthroned upon our praise. Receive our worship, Father God. Because it's us loving on you for who you are, being thankful, being grateful that you are able, that you are willing, that you are. Thank you, God. Father, as we begin, just to transition our worship as our worship moves from the corporate setting to the individual setting, dear God each one equal to the other, necessary hand in hand with the other. We ask that you to keep your hedge of protection around us, watch over us and keep us. That's your promise to us through your word, states, dear God. And in the time that we Come together again in your name. We bless you and we thank you for all that you are and all that you do. Thank you in Jesus' name, Father. Amen. And now let us prepare our hearts to receive the Lord's Supper. And as we do so, scripture comes from Matthew chapter 26 verses 26 through 28 It says, as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it for this is my blood in the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Let us pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, we're grateful to you for these elements of the communion. That as we partake of these, Father God, we partake of a remembrance of all that Jesus did for us, Father God. The salvation, the healing, the 
healing, the restoration, the redemption, Father God. Everything that this represents, we partake of, Lord. We partake today remembering also, Father God, just that we've been set free. But Jesus set us free, so we are free indeed, Lord. We give you thanks, honor, glory, and praise. In Jesus' name. Because even as the word said, on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he blessed it and he gave it to the disciples. He said, take, eat, this is my body. Let us take of the bread. Now I say night he took the cup and he said, drink ye this. For it is his blood shed for many for the remission of sins. Let us partake of the cup. the benediction. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you and we thank you and we praise you. That we stand here as your children, loving, submitted before you, worshiping you, Father God. We just say thank you. Watch over us and keep us. Thank you for the countenance to shine upon us, oh God. Let your countenance shine upon us. Let your glory rest upon us, Father God. Let your light and love flow through us to others. <laughs>